Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering, IIT Guwahati. So far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the host cells, we have discussed about different types of transforming agents, we have discussed about different types of machinery which is uh, we are using and then uh, recently what we have discussed, we have discussed about how to deliver this recombinant DNA into the cell. So, once you de deliver the recombinant DNA into the cell, the next step is you have to select the cells which are go going to receive the DNA and the cells which have not received the DNA, which means if you are taking the colonies, the full colony and then suppose you have done the transfection, you have to do a screening to know the cells which are going to get the, your plasmid or your recombinant DNA because these are the uh, colonies which we are looking for and these are the colonies which we are interested to grow and further use for uh, downstream uh, applications such as we can use them for protein productions or you can be, you use them for any type of study which is uh, transcription studies or translation studies. So, for the screening you have to have the exclusive criteria which you can use to exclude these molecules from these molecules. Now, if you see a typical plasmid, this is the PUC19, what you will see is that you have a ampicillin resistance gene, you have an enzyme which is called as the LAGZ and then so these, so that is why if you take any any plasmids where you have produced the recombinant DNA, you are either going to have the enzyme which you can exploit uh, for two purposes, either you can use a substrate and once you use the substrate, this substrate may get converted into the product by this particular enzyme and this product may be of uh, a unique color or some kind of it may give you some kind of indications that enzyme is active. In some cases you may do exactly reverse that you make this enzyme inactive. In those cases the exactly the reverse is going to be happen. So, the, the molecule the recombinant DNA is not going to show you this activity. Then you have the antibiotic resistance genes, for example, in the case of PUC19 you have the ampicillin resistance. So, you can use this ampicillin resistance. So, the if you have generated the recombinant DNA, the, 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 the recombinant DNA is going to have the ampicillin resistance and that is how if you put these recombinant DNA along with the host onto a, a, a ampicillin containing media. The, the, the cells which have taken up the plasmid will grow whereas the other cells will not grow into go. The third criteria is that phenotypic changes for example, when you transfect the recombinant DNA into the host, it may induce some kind of typical phenotypic changes into the cell which will be clearly visible. Okay. For example, if the cells become fluorescent or cells become uh, blue color or some cells become red color. So, you know that the red cells or the blue cells or the cells which are showing the green fluorescence are actually the cells which have received the DNA, all other cells are not have received the DNA. So, because so these are called as the phenotypic changes into the particular type of cell. So, all these uh, strategies can be used to screen the recombinant clone after the transformation or the transaction. So, once you deliver the DNA, you can use all these approaches to screen the molecules. 
So, first approach is that where you can use the chromogenic substrate of a typical uh, enzyme which you are going to use. So, one of the classical screening method which we have discussed in the past also is called blue white screening where a chromogenic substrate is used to detect a particular enzyme activity where a colorless substrate is processed, uh, processed into a colored compound which means a white color compound is getting converted into a blue color compound. This colorless compound which we use for the blue white screening is called as the X-GAN or 5-bromo-4-chloro-3-endolyl beta galactosidase and this is a substrate for beta galactosidase. Beta galactosidase is an enzyme which is actually be a product of the LAG-Z gene on from the LAG operon. So, LAG operon is the lactose operon and the beta galactosidase it is a tetrameric protein and the initial N terminus G region. So, if this is the protein, the initial region is important for activity of this particular protein. So, what you have to do is in this particular system, what you have to do is you take the host which lacks the lacks the gene without the initial region, whereas the vector contains. So, this particular region which is 11 to 41 is called as the alpha peptide or the alpha region. So, if you remove this particular region, so if you have a bacterial strain which does not contain this particular region, then the lag G what you have is not going to be functional. So, in that case what you do is you take a, you design a vector which actually going to express this missing portion which is called as the alpha peptide and once you you, tra you, you transform this vector containing alpha peptide into the host containing remaining lag Z, the two fragment are going to come together to form the active enzyme which means you are renaturing the, uh, uh, the, the re recovering the activity of the enzyme simply by having one component onto the vector, the rest component onto the host cells. Now, once the two fragments are going to form and will come together, the enzyme is going to be fu functionally active which means it is going to process the colorless uh, uh, product X gal into a blue colored product. Now, in addition, the alpha peptide region is a multiple cloning site and as a result, the insertion of gene, the, uh, the alpha peptide will not be able to synthesize to give fully actual. The enzyme beta galactosidase oxidizes X gal to form 5 bromo 4 chloro endoxyl and galactosidase. The endoxyl derivative is oxidized in air to give the blue color dibromo dichloro derivative hence the blue color containing indicate an active enzyme and absence of insert whereas the colorless colonies indicate presence of an insert. So, what it is saying is that the you have this 11 to 41 part missing and this 11 to 41 part can be supplied by the vector. So, the in a in a typical scenario when you if you in, if you uh, if you uh, transform the vector alone the vector is going to give you the functionally active protein and that's how the x gal is going to be processed to a blue color compound whereas if you clone a gene into the alpha peptide in that case what will happen is the alpha peptide is not going to complement the lag Z and because of that if the recombinant DNA is being formed and it is being transformed into the host, the lag Z is not going to be, lag Z is going to be uh, going to produce a inactive beta galactosidase and once it is producing the inactive beta galactosidase, it is not going to process the X gal to a blue color compound and is a, as a result of that you are going to see the colorless colonies. So, the colorless colonies are the colonies which are going to have the recombinant DNA 
whereas the blue colored colonies are the colonies which are going to have only the empty vector because the empty vector has the functionally active alpha peptide and if you stain them uh, if you if you stain the cells along with the x gal you will see the blue as well as the white color colonies the white color colonies are the recomb uh, the colonies which contains the recombinant dna whereas the blue color colonies are containing the empty vector or non recombinant uh, uh, dna how the blue color is formed this is the beta beta gal when it is been processed by the beta galactosidase it is been converted into a product which is called as the 55 dibromo 44 dichloro indoco and this is a blue color product now let's move on to the next uh, thing next is called antibiotic sensitivity so in the antibiotic sensitivity what you have is that the vector carries a functional is functional selection marker such as the antibiotic resistance genes and that actually can be used to select the clone the antibiotic resistance genes normally produce has the uh, product which has a multiple mechanism to provide the resistance in a host cells you can see you have the canamycin the canamycin resistance gene is going to produce a protein which is called as the neomycin phosphotransferase 2 and what the neomycin phosphorase 2 is going to do it is going to make the covalent modifications of canamycin which means it is going to phosphorylate the canamycin and once it is going to phosphorylate the canamycin the canamycin will not going to perform its antimicrobial activity similarly you have the tetracycline the tetracycline the tetracycline resistance gene is going to produce the several ribosomal protection proteins and that actually will contribute into the a flux of tetracycline which means it is going to throw the tetracycline out of the bacteria and that's how the tetracycline level is going to be very very low into the bacteria and that's how the bacteria is going to acquire the resistance against the tetracycline similarly you have the chloramphenicol the chloramphenicol is chloramphenicol resistance gene is going to produce a protein which is called as the chloramphenicol acyl transferase and that actually is converting the chloramphenicol to acetyl chloramphenicol and acetyl chloramphenicol is inactive compared to the chloramphenicol and that's how the uh, it is going to confer the resistance to the uh, that particular uh, uh, bacteria so in this particular approach a circular plasmid containing antibiotic resistance gene can be able to replicate into the host cells plated onto a antibiotic containing media which means suppose you have the ampicillin resistance gene onto the plasmid you can uh, you can plate these cells which contains the ampicillin resistance gene onto a ampicillin containing media in the cloning of a fragment into the plasmid the plasmid is cut with a restriction enzyme and a fragment in the is ligated to give a circular plasmid with insert the transformation of both the dna species cut plasmid and the circular clone into the host and plated onto the antibiotic containing solution media only the circularized clone will give you the colonies whereas the cut plasmid will not grow as it has lost the antibiotic resistance genes which means if you have the insert so what you do is you put the insert into the plasmid and go go for a ligation reactions it will give you the circular plasmid whereas in the other case you are going to have the linear plasmids which is still contain the ampicillin resistance because it is a linear plasmid it is not going to express the ampicillin resistance gene and that's how this will not going to confer any resistance so when you do the transformation of the uncut, uh, cut cut vector as well as the recombinant clone the recombinant clone will give you the colonies because on the ampicillin containing media whereas the cut vector is going to give you the no colonies and that's how you can use the antibiotic sensitivity as a criteria to select the recombinant clones now 
The second approach is insertional inactivation. What is mean by insertional activation is that you have a functional protein or functional product and what you can do is you can just clone within that functional gene and because of that you are going to disrupt the function of that particular protein. So, as it said in this approach a foreign DNA is cloned within the coding gene responsible for a particular type of phenotype. As a result of the insertion the gene product is not available to modulate the phenotype of the host and that is how in the in the in the control conditions the host will going to show you the modified phenotype whereas if the insertional inactivation is going to happen it is not going to show you that particular phenotype and as a result you can be able to select the molecules this approach is known as the insertional inactivation as it can be used with a suitable genetic system so, the first is insertional inactivation of a lag Z. So, this approach is exactly the opposite what we have discussed just now where we were using the lag Z uh, complementation. So, we were, gen we were re regenerating the complement uh, lag Z. In this case, you have a functional lag Z onto the vector and that actually produces the functional beta galactosidase and that actually form processes the X scale to blue color product. Whereas, if you are actually using a BAMH1 site and you are inserting your gene within the lag Z site. So, what will happen is that you are going to produce a recombinant DNA, but what in this process you have destroyed the lag Z gene and as a result you are not going to produce the functional beta galactosidase you will going to produce a non functional galactosidase and that is how it is not going to be able to process the X gal to give you the blue colored colonies and what you are going to get is the colorless colonies and these colorless colonies indicate the recombination uh, the delivery of recombinant DNA into the host. So, the X gal system can be used to detect the insertional inactivation of lag the gene to screen the cloned fragment. If the gene is inserted to the lag Z, the clone will not be able to produce a functional beta galactosidase. Hence, the blue color colonies indicate the presence of an active enzyme, whereas the absence of an insert, uh, blue colored colonies indicate the presence of an active enzyme or the absence of insert, whereas the colorless colonies indicate the presence of an insert. Okay. So, this is the one of the example where insertional inactivations in the lag Z gene will give you the uh, criteria to screen the, uh, the uh, transformation of the clone into the host. Now, let us talk about the antibiotic resistance gene. So, you, if you remember we have discussed about the PBR322 the one of the classical and the first vector which has been developed by the molecular biologist and the PBR322 has the two ampicillin two antibiotic resistance genes one is called ampicillin resistance gene and the other one is called as the tetracycline resistance genes and uh, so suppose you have used the ampicillin resistance gene and you have cloned a uh, insert within the ampicillin resistance gene so which means if you use this fragment this fragment is going to have no resistance for ampicillin, but it is going to have the resistance for tetracycline. So, once you transform this into a transform bacteria, you are going to get the colonies. Now, what you have to do is make a replica of these colonies and grow them onto the tetracycline. So, all the bacteria will grow whether your insert is present or not because the tetracycline is intact in both the conditions whether the vector has the insert or whether the in vector does not have the insert. So, these are the colonies which are actually tetracycline resistance. Now, what you do is take these colonies and grow them onto the ampicillin. So, what will happen? The, some of the colonies will die because they are not going to contain the ampicillin resistance. So, what are the colonies are being died? These are the 
थ्री कॉलोनीज विच आर बीन डाइड वाइल यू आर स्क्रीनिंग दैम ऑन टू द एम्पिसन ओके सो दीज आर द कॉलोनीज विच आर एक्चुअली रिसीव्ड द रिकॉम्बिनेंट डी एन ए और सो नाउ यू कैन टेक दिस एंड गो टू द ओरिजिनल मास्टर प्लेट एंड एक्सट्रैक्ट दैम सो यू कैन टेक आउट दीज कॉलोनीज एंड यू कैन यूज दैम फॉर डाउन स्ट्रीम एप्लीकेशन सो दिस इज एक्चुअली कॉल्ड एज द इंसर्शनल इनएक्टिवेशन अप्रोच वेयर यू आर यूजिंग द इंसर्शनल इनएक्टिवेशन ऑफ एम्पिसन रेजिस्टेंस जीन और वन ऑफ द एंटीबायोटिक रेजिस्टेंस जीन्स एंड देन यू आर यूजिंग द टू एंटीबायोटिक्स टू स्क्रीन योर डिजायरेबल क्लोज नाउ द थर्ड अप्रोच इज वेयर यू आर डूइंग द इंसर्शनल इनएक्टिवेशन ऑफ सी आई और Uh, the factor the ci is a is a crucial factor and response to the temperature so ci is a repressor which actually modulate the virus's activity between a lytic cycle to lysogenic cycle so within the lytic cycle lysis of the host to release the virus particle whereas the lysogenic stage allows the replication of the viruses without lysis of the host and the ci gene or the ci repressor encodes a ci gene is a is encodes a ci repressor and which is actually responsible for the formation of the lysogens in the presence of functional uh, functional uh, ci protein the the plaques contains uh, unlysed host cells and has a turbid appearance whereas in the absence of it it will be clear this feature can be used to screen the clone to detect functional ci which means absence of clones so if you have the functional ci it is means your you have your clone is not been inserted but if the ci is been insertionally inactivated then the ci is not going to perform the function and that's how you are going to confirm the presence of insert so you can imagine that ci is actually a ci repressor which actually controls the activity of the virus between the lytic phase to lysogenic phase and the lytic phase is actually responsible for the lysis of the host cells and that's how it is going to produce the plaques whereas the lysogenic phase is allowing the viruses to replicate within the host cells without forming the plaque so once you insert into uh, once you take your recombinant gene and insert into the uh, ci uh, ci genes with the help of the bamh1 what will happen is you are not going to generate the functionally active ci protein and once you cannot generate the functionally active ci protein the virus cannot go to the lysogenic cycle it has to go through the lytic cycle and that's how it is actually going to form the plaques so if you see the formation of plaques after your cloning as well as the trans uh, transfection using the this particular type of vector the viral vector you will be sure that the your insert is within the ci gene and it has formed the plaques now the last approach is that the complementation of mutations in this approach a mutant strain so you use the mutant strain and can be used to screen the plasmid containing the missing gene and the transformants will go only if the gene product from the clone will complement the functions in general the genes taking part in metabolic pathway or biocentric pathway are routinely been used in this process so in the complementation of mutation what you have is you have the host strain which cannot synthesize a particular gene product for example you may have the uh, mutations within the uracil biosynthesis pathway or you may have some of the essential amino acids biosynthesis pathway in those cases as long until you won't supply those particular functional gene from the ex externally supplied uh, vector it is not going to survive into a deficient media so the so the uh, uh, host strain will grow on to the normal media which contains that particular essential item for example if you are uh, talking about the uracil 
biosynthesis pathway okay and some of the genes of this uracil biosynthesis pathways are mutated into the host strain then this particular host will not grow into a uracil minus media as long as you will not supply the uracil synthesizing gene by the vector. So, if you supply the uh, gene by the vector this particular uh, recombinant transformed uh, uh, host will grow onto the uracil minus media, but onto a normal media which contains the uracil the host strain will grow normally. So, in these cases you will going to have the host strain which is deficient in that particular gene or that particular enzyme and that enzyme you will supply by the direct by the uh, externally supplied vector. There are three important requirement of this approach to work. One which is very important is that you should have a host strain which is deficient in a particular gene. If the gene belongs to the biosynthetic pathway the mutant host in this case are called as the auxotroph as the host depends on the gene product or the final product of the biosynthetic pathway as a supplement in media which means the first requirement to, to use this particular screening method is that you should have a host strain which is deficient in that particular enzyme or that particular factor. If this factor is a part of the biosynthetic pathway then the host strain slowly depends on the uh, either that particular product or the final product of the biosynthetic pathway and in those cases the host strain is being uh, called as the oxotroph on and that particular media. For example, in this case the if you are using the uh, yeast and if you are using the uracil then the yeast is going to be the oxotroph for uracil. The third is you should have a defined media which should not contains that particular nutrient which you are using for screening purposes which means it is going to have the missing nutrients. And then the third is you should have a vector which actually could be able to supply that particular gene product which can supply this particular nutrient so that the you will going to do a complementation and that is how the, uh, the uh, host which are going to receive this particular type of vector is going to survive into the media deficient into this particular important nutrients. And uh, let us continue our discussion about the screening of clones in the case of eukaryotic uh, uh, host. So, what we were discussing? We were discussing about the complementation of a particular mutation and in this particular approach the host is having the mutation in the essential genes and if the these essential genes are part of the biosynthetic pathway then the host is dependent solely on providing this particular nutrients or this particular down, uh, uh, downstream final product for uh, surviving and running its metabolism in this in those course in in those cases the host is considered to be an oxotroph for path for for that particular nutrients and as I as we discussed in this particular approach there are three requirement one uh, where the host should have the mutation in one of the crucial uh, gene or the pathway uh, so that uh, it should be dependent on the providing this particular factor from the exogenously provided the uh, vector. Then you should have a suitable vector so that it should be able to provide that particular factor. And the third is that the um, you should have a defined media which should not have this particular nutrients. So, in the case of yeast, yeast has four different uh, genes uh, which are part of this particular uh, approach. Uh, these are the four genes of part of the four different uh, uh, biosynthetic pathways whether it is for the histidine, leucine, tryptophan or the uracil. And all these four genes and their uh, mutations is being found in the yeast uh, different yeast strains and that is why you can use these particular uh, uh, genes 
for uh, performing this uh, approach which is called as the complementation of the mutations and this approach can be done in two different ways in, the, in two different ways one is called as the positive selection the other one is called as the negative selection what is mean by the positive selection the positive selection is that in the positive selection the host strain does not grow on the media lacking the functional gene which means the host has the some kind of particular mutations so that's why the host will not grow on the media as long as it does not contain that particular metabolite or that particular nutrient but the host transform with the recombinant clone which is actually going to provide or going to supply these gene product will allow this particular host to grow on the media in the absence of that particular nutrient. So, this is called as the positive selection which means if your gene is present the clone is going to grow on the media deficient in that particular nutrient. But the other approach is that you can have the negative selection. In the negative selection what you can do is uh, a chemical compound can be added to the media which will be converted to the cytotoxic agent in the presence of gene product and as a result it does not allow the growth of the wild type cell which means the wild type cell are actually uh, uh, producing a active enzyme and this active enzyme you can add some chemical and that chemical is going to be get converted into a cytotoxic agent and then because the, uh, the enzyme is active the wild type is going to get killed. But if the host strain is going to be transformed with the recombinant clone has non-functional gene product and grow in the presence of the compound in the media. So, if you supply the host strain and it is transformed in recombinant clone which will going to uh, uh, which will going to disrupt this particular gene product then even in the presence of that particular chemical the uh, the, ho the transform host cell is going to uh, grow. One of the example is URA3 uh, gene which is actually coding for the ornithine 5 monophosphate decarboxylase. So, this is an enzyme which actually processing a compound which is called as the 5-fluorouretic uh, acid to a very very toxic fluorodeoxyuridine. So, what you do is you add the 5-fluorouretic acid and in the presence of OMP decarboxylase which is going to be produced by the ura 3 and to a very very toxic fluorodeoxyuridine and the fluorodeoxyuridine is very toxic so it will not allow the host to grow. But if you uh, clone your insert within the ura 3 gene what you are going to do is you are going to produce a non-functional OAMP decarboxylase and in that present in that uh, in, in the absence of the uh, uh, functional OAMP decarboxylase the uh, the 5 fluorouretic acid will not going to be get converted into the fluorodeoxyuridine which means the the compound will not going to exert its toxic effect and as a result you are going to see the colonies onto the plate so this is called as the negative selections now let's move on to the higher eukaryotic uh, uh, organism such as the mammalian cells and let's see how you can select the mammalian cells when they are being transformed or when they are being transfected with the extra uh, with the recombinant clones. So, the screening of transformed or transfected mammalian cell is being done in a utilizing the different types of approach. One of the classical approach is the reporter gene assay. In the reporter gene assay what you have is that in the reporter gene assay a chimeric construct is produced with an enzyme gene product in the form of in the front of the promoter of the gene of interest. So, general report general uh, uh, gene reporter construct contains a eukaryotic promoter so that you will be able to produce that particular gene utilizing the cellular machinery of the mammalian cells and an enzyme which is going to give you a readouts which means this enzyme is going to process a substrate 
to a product and this product may give you some kind of uh, fluorescence or luminescence or some kind of uh, readable uh, uh, product. The, the reporter gene construct is going to be transfected to the mammalian cells with a suitable transfection agent such as the uh, lipofectamine or other kind of transfection reagent which we have discussed. The cells are now sti stimulated with the agents to stimulate the production of transcription factors to bind the promoter. So, what will happen is the uh, when you when you stimulate the cells to produce the transcription factor, this transcription factor will come and bind to the promoter and that is how they will drive the transcription as well as the translation of this particular reporter gene and once the uh, translation of the reporter gene is being done, it is going to produce the enzyme and this enzyme is going to process this particular substrate to form the product and that product can be measured by many means. For example, it can be used uh, by uh, fluor uh, fluorescence method or luminescence method or simple the chlorimetry method. A suitable substrate is required is added to measure the activity of the reporter enzyme. There are several examples of reporter gene system. So, in the in the, in a, in a different uh, system you can use the different types of reporter gene constructs. For example, the CAT, CAT is a gene which is uh, reporting which is uh, expressing for the chloramphenicol acyl transferase and that actually converts the chloramphenicol to acetyl chloramphenicol. So, you can catalyze this reaction and know. Lag Z which is actually expressing the beta galactosidase and the beta galactosidase can be used to monitor this reaction where the ortho nitrophenyl beta galactosidase will be get converted into the ortho nitrophenol and galactose and ortho nitrophenol is going to give you the color and that can be uh, used to monitor the activity of beta galactosidase. Simply you have the LUG gene which is going to produce the luciferase and the luciferase enzyme is going to convert the luciferin to oxyluciferin and the oxyluciferin is going to give you the luminescence and the luminescence can be measured in a luminometer. Similarly, you have 4A, 4A gene is actually producing the alkaline phosphatase and the alkaline phosphatase is releasing the inorganic phosphate from the substrates. So, you can use the different types of substrate to monitor the, uh, the release of inorganic phosphate and at the end you have the green fluorescent protein, the green fluorescent protein or the GFP which is actually going to give you the fluorescence in the green channel. So, let us see few examples. One of the classical example is the luciferase based reporter gene construct. The luciferase uh, based, luciferase based uh, uh, reporter gene construct is that where the luciferase which is an enzyme present in the abdomen of firefly fortinus parilus. So, this is a uh, uh, this is a commonly found firefly which is uh, producing this enzyme in their abdomen and because it catalyzes this reaction the it the abdomen of this particular fly is uh, glowing in the night. The enzyme utilizes the the enzyme utilizes the luciferin as a substrate to form the oxyluciferin and in the presence of at ATP and magnesium, the luciferin is uh, converted into the luciferin adnylate which means the enzyme is converting the luciferin to the luciferin adnylate in the presence of ATP. So, in this process it is actually utilizing the ATP to form PPI and the AMP is getting conjugated to the luciferin to form the luciferin adnylate and the luciferin adnylate undergoes the oxidative decarboxylation which means this particular product is getting oxidative decarboxylation to form the oxyluciferin and once it is going through this oxidative decarboxylation, it actually emits the light from this. So, the oxygen is being utilized and that actually produces the uh, light and this is a short lived signal. So, as soon as the uh, luciferin adnylate is getting de uh, oxidatively decarboxylated to form the oxyluciferin, 
uh, it actually uh, produces the small amount of light and that light can be measured simply by an uh, into the luminometer. Uh, the reporter gene construct containing the luciferase is transfected to the mammalian cells and the cells are washed with PBS and lysed with a lysis buffer. Take the lysate into the luminometer or cuvette and the luciferase substrate is injected to start the reaction and measure immediately in a luminometer. So, as I said this signal is very short lived. So, you what you have to do is you first transfect the construct into the mammalian cells then once the reaction is or once the stimulation is over then you can lyse the cells collect the lysate and put it into the uh, into the uh, um, into the cuvette or the plate the illumination plate and then you add the substrate to measure the activity so these are the things are been depicted here in a in a in a schematic diagram that you take the uh, uh, luciferase expressing vector transfect that to the mammalian expression system it will go and express the luciferase and then once the uh, stimulation is over which means you can stimulate these cells because the luciferase will be in control to the eukaryotic promoter the luciferase will be produced inside the cell according to the level of stimulation what is being uh, produced from this eukaryotic cell then you can collect this lysate and put it this lysate into the black plate which is actually the uh, ideal plate for doing the luciferase reactions. You can con include some negative control as well as the positive control and then you add the substrate into this and once uh, the substrate you, you add the substrate you put it into the multimode reader or the luminometer and once you do that you are going to see a short lived signal from the uh, enzyme. Now let us move on to the next uh, approach. The next approach is that you can actually express the green fluorescent protein into the cell and the green fluorescent protein is a, is a reporter gene to screen the cells containing the recombinant protein fluorescently tagged with the GFP at their C terminus. The cells receiving recombinant DNA will give green fluorescence and it can be visualized with an inverted fluorescent microscope or it can be analyzed in a flow cytometry to separate the GFP containing cells from the untransfected cells which means the GFP is a green fluorescent protein it gives the green fluorescence. So, in the first step what you do is you take the cells you transfect them with the GFP if the construct is getting into the cell it is actually going to give the green fluorescence. So, all the cells which are actually giving the green fluorescence are transfected cells and all these transfected cells can be separated uh, from the non-transfected cell which are not going to give you the green fluorescence simply by using the flow cytometer. So, flow cytometer is an instrument which actually separates the molecule based on the fluorescence based on the size and shape also. So, you can select the cells based on the size and shape and then you can measure the fluorescence if the if the cells are showing the green fluorescence you can ask the instrument to collect these cells. A typical uh, fluorescence curve will look like something like this where these are the cells the black colored line are the control cells or the non-transfected cell whereas the green color cells are considered to be the GFP expressing cells. So, you can ask the instrument to collect these cells into the separate wells and uh, that is how you can select the transfected cells from the non-transfected cells. So, the flow cytometer uh, analyzes the cell based on shape, uh, shape size and the fluorescence level. A non-fluorescent cell is giving the separate peak as compared to the fluorescently labeled cells and with the help of flow cytometer both of these peaks can be collected in a separate tubes besides GFP because the GFP is giving green fluorescence you can also have the option of red fluorescent proteins you can use the yellow fluorescent protein you can use the cyan fluorescent proteins and so on and all these fluorescent protein are 
a very popular to label the protein and uh, uh, to separate the transfected cell from the non-transfected cell. So, this is all about the uh, isolation or to uh, detection of the transfection into the cell or to screening of the clone based on the some of the selection markers which are available onto the vectors. And once you uh, are sure that the host or you have selected the desirable clones, the next step is that you have to confirm that your, your host is containing the clone which also contains the right gene. So, for confirming the clone, what you are supposed to do is that you are going to sequence the complete uh, gene to know that whatever you have cloned the foreign gene is actually intact, it does not have any mutations and it is actually in the right frame. So, for that purpose you have to do a DNA sequencing to confirm the clones or the confirm the DNA isolated from these clones. So, for that purpose uh, we have the so, there are uh, only two methods or uh, there are two uh, methods which we are going to discuss in this particular uh, lecture. So, in both of these methods are having the similar principle that they are actually breaking the DNA either by using the chemical or the enzymatic method into the smaller fragments and then they are being. Uh, so, what you are doing is suppose this is your uh, full gene length, what you are doing is you are actually cutting this DNA into the smaller fragments and once you do that, you are going to get these fragments, small fragments from this particular uh, DNA. But apart from this, you are also going to get the these fragments as well, which means the fragments which are overlapping this region or this region or this region, which means, uh, so if you analyze all these fragments, you will be able to, uh, you will be able to put them into a right order and that is how you can be able to sequence them using the, these techniques. So, we are going to discuss the two methods, one is called as the Sanger method, the other one is called as the Maxim Gilbert method. So, in the dideoxy chain termination method or the Sanger method, which is actually been developed by the Frederick Sanger in 1977, for which the Frederick Sanger got the Nobel Prize. And uh, uh, so, Frederick Sanger was the only person who got the Nobel Prize first for uh, discovering the method of uh, protein sequencing, and uh, then he has developed another method for doing the uh, DNA sequencing and for both of these discoveries, the Frederick Sanger got the Nobel Prize. So, in this method what we are doing is, we are generating a single standard DNA uh, as a template, we are using single standard DNA as a template to synthesize the complementary copy with the help of a polymerase, which means typically we are just doing the PCR in the presence of nucleotides. The polymerization reactions, you know the polymerization reaction requires the enzyme uh, which means the DNA polymerase, it requires the nucleotides and it requires the primers. If you remember when we were discussing about the PCR, so these are the three re things we require for the primers you need the forward primer as well as the reverse primer. So, in this case we do not use the forward or the reverse primer, we use only one of the primers and because we have to just generate the single standard DNA. So, what you do is in the polymerization reaction you have the primer, you nucleotide. So, the, the nucleotide what you are going to add, you know that the, we have four different types of nucleotide adenine, guanine, cytosine and thymine. So, when you do these reactions, you add three uh, nucleotides, normal nucleotides which means either adenine, guanine and cytosine and the f instead of fourth nucleotide, you add the 2,3-dideoxynucleotide triphosphate which means suppose if this is a reaction for adenine, then you add the guanine, cytosine and thymine as a, as a normal nucleotide and you add the 2'-3'-dideoxynucleotide two, two prime, prime adenine triphosphate as the 
fourth nucleotide. So what will happen is when the DNA polymerase utilizes the dideoxynucleotide uh, as a nucleotide, the dideoxynucleotide is does not have the uh, does is just blocks the uh, growing chain. So that is how as soon as the DNA polymerase utilizes the dideoxynucleotides, it actually blocks the chain terminations due to the absence of the 3 prime hydroxyl group. In the typical sequencing reaction, you, you use the 4 different types of dideoxynucleotides which means you are going to do the 4 reaction, one for adenine, one for guanine, one for cytosine and one for thymine and then you are going to run these 4 separate reactions onto the high resolution electrophoresis gels and then you separate these 4 reactions and then you analyze them and that once you interpret these uh, you will be able to get the sequence of that particular DNA. So, in a typical uh, dideoxy chain termination method, you can actually do this method in two, uh, utilizing the two different protocols. One is called as the Sanger's original protocol, which Sanger has been developed. So, in this, what you have is in the step one, you add a primer and let it be an allele, allele to the three prime end of the DNA polymerase, a uh, DNA template, which means suppose this is the region which you have to sequence. In the Sanger's method, what you add is first you add the primer, okay, which is going to anneal onto the three prime end of the DNA template. Then, in the second step, you use the radio labeled ATP to label the primers, which means you are actually tagging the primer with a particular type of radioactivity. Now, after this, in the step three, what you do is you take this particular reaction and divide that into the 4 aliquots or 4 reactions and in all the 4 reactions you are going to add the either adenine or thymine, guanine or cytosine. So, you are going to do the reactions for all the 4 nucleotides by using the uh, different types of dideoxynucleotides which means in if you are doing a reaction for adenine, you will add all other 3 nucleotides which means you are going to add guanine, cytosine and thymine, but what you are going to add, you are going to add the dideoxy adenine uh, triphosphate and then once you do that, you add the chase which means you are going to allow these reactions to happen. So, what will happen is the, the, the places where you are going to add the uh, DNTP, uh, DD NTPs for adenine, thymine or guanine or cytosine, it is actually going to terminate the reactions on that particular nucleotides, which means if you are doing uh, A reactions, the termination would be for A. If you do the T reactions, then the termination would be on thymines. If you do the reactions for guanine, then it is termination on the guanosine and if you do it for cytosine, then the termination will be on the cytosine. Whereas, in the alternate reaction which is called as the label, labeling or the termination protocol, the step 1 remains the same where you add the primers and let it be annealed onto the 3 prime over end. Then what you add is you add the limited amount of NTPs along with one of the radio labeled nucleotide to label the DNA throughout the length. Then you add the polymerase reaction into the 4 reactions and then you do exactly the same what is being discussed for the Sanger's protocol and the polymerase reactions continue with the 4 nucleotide and one of the nucleotide would be the dideoxynucleotides and synthesis is terminated at the specific dideoxynucleotides to give the DNA fragments of different lengths. Now, once you analyze, uh, once you follow the protocols, whether it is Sanger's protocol or the ter termination protocol, you are going to get the DNA fragments, uh, which means you are going to get the four reactions. And now, you run these four reactions onto the high sensitivity sequencing gels, which are actually the polyacrylamide gels. And the once you run them, you are going to separate these small stretches of DNA. And then what you are going to do, you are going to do the autoradiograms because the primers are labeled. So, you can do autoradiogram and that actually will going to give you the bands. Now, let us see how you are going to interpret. So, imagine that you have done the A reactions, T reactions, G reactions and 
C reaction which means in the C reactions you have the three nucleotides which are normal and the fourth one is DDNTP which is actually the cytosine. Similarly is for the guanine, similarly for thiamine and arginine. So, once you have performed the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, separations you are going to get the autoradiogram like this. So, this is the lane for A, this is for T, this is for G, this is for C. Now, what you are supposed to do is you are going to read in a reverse order which means you will first go to the, the lowermost band. So, in, the, in this case the lowermost band is in the A lane, so you are going to write A. Now, the next band is in the T, so you are going to write the T. Now, the third band is also again in the T, so you will write A T T. Now, the fourth band is again in the A, so you will actually going in the reverse direction, which you are going in the reverse direction like this, like this. Okay? So, you will be keep moving, keep moving and ultimately it will going to tell you the sequence of DNA. In case the places where you have the bands on the same height, then you will be able to distinguish simply by looking at the other nucleotides. Uh, so that is how you, you uh, so you can imagine, you can, dis, you can understand this that the, in the case of A all the termination happens on the A, in the T all the terminations are happening. So this means the terminal nucleotide is going to be the T in the case of T reactions, terminal nucleotides will be A in the case of A nucleotide and that is what is given here. Okay. So that is how you actually if you go by the in the reverse order you will be able to uh, 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 interpret the uh, sequencing and you will be able to deduce the complete sequence of the DNA. Now let us move on to the next step. So the next method is called as the Maxim Gilbert method. The Maxim Gilbert method was discovered by the Maxim as well as the Gilbert in 1977 which is actually based on the chemical modification and subsequent cleavage. So, if you remember the Sanger method is based on the PCR uh, mediated uh, reactions which means where the enzymatic uh, enzymes are also been involved DNA polymerase and other kind of enzymes and once you incorporate the enzymes actually you are also uh, could make the mistakes because the, you know that all these DNA polymerases have the some level of processivity. So, if the DNA polymerase incorporate A instead of T because even if the template is saying that you have to incorporate A and it is incorporates T, uh, you, your, your sequencing may not be correct because the ultimately what you are going to get is the, uh, the reactions or the bands and that is how the Sanger method was uh, dependent on the enzymatic or the enzymes to give you the final DNA sequence which means the whole method depends on the sensitivity and the accuracy of the DNA polymerase which you are using for these reactions. Whereas in the case of Maxim Gilbert method, the Maxim Gilbert method utilizes the base modification as well as the cleavage. So, in this method you actually first modify the bases and then you, you, you catalyze uh, cleavage reactions. In this method also what you what you are supposed to do is either you label the 3 prime or the 5 prime of the DNA and then you treat the DNA with a with a base specific chemicals which are going to uh, the modify the bases and then you add the cleavage reaction and that actually is going to cleave the DNA at the random stuffs or random places. These fragments are then you analyze on a high resolution polyacrylamide gel and subsequently you develop them in a autoradiogram. The fragment with the terminal radio labeled appear as band in the gel. For Maxim Gilbert method, the chemical reaction has to be done in two different pro, uh, steps. In the step 1, so the chemical reactions are being performed in two steps the base specific reactions which means you are going to perform the base specific reactions to modify the nucleotides. These you have to do for guanine and uh, all other uh, nucleotides. So, the in reaction 1 you have to do for the 
with the with the dimethyl sulfate and di, what the dimethyl sulfate is going to do it is going to modify the n7 of guanine and it is going to open the ring between the c8 and n9 and these reactions are called as the g reaction because it is modifying the guanine into the dna in the reaction two you are going to add the formic acid and that actually going to modify the purine nucleotide which means it is going to modify the guanine as well as the adenine and that's why this reaction is going to be called as g plus a reaction now in the reaction 3 you are going to use the hydrazine and that actually will going to modify the all um, py uh, pyrimidines and that's why it is called as the thymine and cytosine because it is going to modify the all the thymine as well as the cytosine and that is called as the C reaction. So, you can see that we have used the four different reagents and all these four reagents are um, at, uh, is specifically modifying either the guanine or guanine or adenine or th th threonine and uh, thymine and cytosine or the cytosine reaction. Once you have done all these modifications, then you will perform a cleavage reactions and after the base specific reactions are over, then you add the piperidine, which is actually going to replace the modified bases and catalyze the cleavage of phosphodiester bond and that is how it is going to generate the DNA fragments of random sizes and these, gen uh, these uh, uh, DNA of the random sizes are then going to be separate onto the high resolution polyclamide gels and subsequently you will do the autoradiogram and you will get the bands. Now what you are going to do, you are actually getting the four reactions G, G plus A reactions, T plus C reactions and C reactions. So, this is the pattern in the G reaction, G plus A reaction, T plus C reaction and C reaction. So, how the interpretation goes on? The fragment in G lane is read as G whereas, the fragment present in G plus A, uh, but absent in G is read as A, okay? which means if you are getting the two bands, one is in the G lane and the one is the G plus A land, which means you are going to have G and A together. But suppose you have the bands in the, you do not have the bands in the G lane, then the band which is present in the A land, a, 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 G plus A land is going to be read as the A. Similarly, the fragments in C is read as C, which is, which means all these fragments are having the terminal C, whereas the fragment present in T plus C, but it is absent in C is termed as the T. Now, let us see how it is done. You have here the G, here you have G plus A, okay, which means you are actually having this as G. In the second one, you see that here you have a G plus A lane, but the band into the corresponding position within the G reaction is absent, which means this is actually a band for A reactions. So, that is why it becomes G A. Now, you go to the T plus C you will see that T plus C has a band, but the corresponding band in the C reaction is absent. That is why it is, this is going to be T. So, you write the T. Now, in the fourth lane, if it is a reaction in, if you have a band in both the lanes, which means it is going to be C. Same is true here. So, in this case also, you will go in the reverse orientation, which is, which means this is going to be the uh, last nucleotide, then the second last and second last and so on. So, these, so that is how you are actually going to interpret the DNA sequencing results from the Maxim Gilbert method, where you are going to read from the bottom and if you have the bands both in the G as well as G plus A, then it is considered to be G. If you do not have the bands in G lane, but you have the bands in G plus A, then it is going to be considered as A and same is true for the T plus C and the C also. So, this is what we have discussed so far. Apart from these two methods, which are actually the older method, which are uh, 
uh, more important in terms of the understanding how the process been evolved. But currently, we do not use uh, the Sanger or the Maxim Gilbert method. What we use is some of the uh, high throughput uh, sequencing technologies, which actually gives more accurate result as well as they also give you the result in a very, very small period of time. So, with this we would like to conclude our lecture here and in the subsequent lectures now what we are going to discuss, we are going to discuss about how to exploit this uh, transformed host colonies or transformed host to uh, produce the proteins for downstream biotechnology applications. Uh, and in that particular kind of discussion, we are going to discuss how to, what are the different strategies you can uh, use or you, what are the different strategies you can adopt for uh, protein production into the uh, prokaryotic system as well as the eukaryotic system. So, with this I would like to conclude our lecture here. Thank you.